we're live now, and today is uh, uh, Wednesday, May 12th. It's about 9.06 a.m., and I'd like to welcome everybody to the best committee in the building, House Transportation, and uh, welcome all you out there in YouTube land. So this morning, we're going to hear from Annie Bordon. Did I get that? I got that right, the pronunciation. Good. Thank you. Uh, from CarShare Vermont, uh, speaking to us about how CarShare works and some of their programs. So, uh, and, and if anybody uh, would like to follow along on her PowerPoint, uh, her documents are on our uh, webpage, House Committee webpage, and uh, under today's date. So, welcome, Annie, uh, and glad to have you here, and, and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Um, so by way of introduction, again, my name is Annie Borden. I'm the founder and executive director of CarShare Vermont, um, which has been around since 2008, serving the Burlington area. And I got my start in car sharing um, 20 years ago, which is hard to believe, in the, um, in the Bay Area, actually in San Francisco, and specifically in the nonprofit car sharing model of, of truly being mission-based, community-based, of trying to provide um, community members with an alternative to private vehicle ownership. Hi, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, what I've put together is a, a primer on car sharing, recognizing that some of you may be unfamiliar with the mode in general, um, and then open up. I, I welcome any questions, and, and hopefully this is um, new information for you. So if it's okay, I will um, share my screen and start the PowerPoint. Lori, can you do that? She should be all set now. Okay, thank what? you. More, well, before you start, Annie. Sure. Uh, good morning, Dan. Welcome, welcome to the committee. Good morning. Sorry, I was running late and I had the wrong link day in that I was logging in. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Happens yeah. to the best of us. Okay, it's all yours, Dan. Okay. <laughs> thank you for being here, car share this morning. A little hectic, a little hectic this morning, and also this morning I was dealing with. Uh, I just text Gabrielle might have had the same problem, so Representative Stebbins will be joining us as well. So, thank you for being here, and we look forward to hearing about car share because we heard um, heard about it during um, some testimony uh, on the in uh, in response to the T bill on replace your ride. I think. Oh, excellent. Great. That's good context. Um, so I'll get started. So just to offer a little bit of background on car sharing as a mode, because CarShare Vermont is not the only service provider for, for car sharing. Um, it originated in Europe in the 1980s as an alternative to private vehicle ownership. So the idea was that why do we need a car or, or two vehicles per household when we could be sharing a more efficient network of vehicles for when people have a vehicle need? And the concept made its way to North America about a decade later in the 90s, um, first in Canada and shortly after in the US. Um, and, it, and it really um, expanded throughout the United States, largely in urban areas in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, there have not been a whole lot of new car sharing providers to come on scene um, in the past decade. However, car sharing membership has been growing within the existing industry. So it is still very much a thriving industry across the world. Um, car sharing is unique from car rentals, car pooling, ride sharing, ride hailing like Uber and Lyft. It, it has some pretty unique features that makes it distinct from those other modes. Typically, it's a decentralized network. So vehicles are located near where users live and work and can easily access them. It's membership based. So you join the organization to be able to gain access, but membership is usually open to just about anybody who, has, who meets basic driving criteria. For our service, that means being at least 18 years old, having at least two consecutive years of driving history and a clean um, driving record. I, it's a self accessible system. So unlike a, a car rental uh, where you would go on site to a rental agency, rent the vehicle, check in and out with a person and return it during the specified hours, car sharing is open 24 seven. So if you have an urgent need for a vehicle at two o'clock in the morning, you can book a car, go to it, self access it with your own electronic key fob or other device, get in and go. And it's pay per use. So unlike vehicle ownership, where you pay for a vehicle, 
whether or not you you drive it often and it's sitting in your driveway. Um, with car sharing, you pay for every trip, and that makes people more aware of their transportation spending, or at least their 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 spending on driving a, a vehicle. And it can allow for better budgeting and planning. It also facilitates a reduction in driving. That price sensitivity makes people think about, hmm, is this a trip uh, for which I need to take my vehicle or could I walk, bike, take transit, figure out another mode to get there, get a ride from a friend, carpool. Um, today in the world, there are several different models of car sharing. So the traditional model that we had started back in, in San Francisco is, is what we have here in the Burlington area. It's called station-based, um, where it's a round trip, shared trip or a round trip car share. So you um, pick up the vehicle and return it to the same location. In other cities that are larger and have uh, where there's greater density and where there are policies to facilitate uh, parking anywhere in neighborhoods, there's one-way car sharing where you could pick up a car from one location and drop it at another and another person can pick it up from that location and the vehicles kind of just self-distribute. Um, <clears throat> today in the industry, there are a number of different providers of car sharing. What was originally uh, kind of an independent um, whether for-profit or non-profit, driven by in independent operators. Now the market is kind of owned largely by auto manufacturers and auto rental companies. So companies like Enterprise and Avis have purchased a lot of the original car sharing providers. Um, and they've, they've, including some very successful uh, non-profit operators. Um, and then there are a handful of independent non-profit operators and for-profit operators that serve smaller cities. We are unique, CarShare Vermont is unique in being one of the very few operators in a city as small as Burlington um, in a largely rural state. So the only kind of similar program to ours, a good example would be in Ithaca, New York. Um, otherwise, car sharing mostly exists in kind of more dense urban areas. It doesn't mean that there isn't demand or a need for different car sharing models, but the, with the way the current market works is in larger cities. So a little bit more about, about us, CarShare Vermont. So as I mentioned, we were founded in 2008 um, with a mission to provide an affordable, convenient, and reliable alternative to private vehicle ownership that enhances the environmental, economic, and social well-being of our region and planet. And we do this by providing the self-accessible 24-7 uh, car sharing service that's available to our community. We also develop and implement a range of mission-oriented um, programs that try to help people um, understand the environmental and uh, economic impacts of vehicle ownership and driving. Um, we also want to improve mobility for people who otherwise may not have access to a vehicle. Um, and this, we do this in a number of ways through education outreach programs, but also through our mobility share program, which provides uh, free memberships to uh, households and individuals with low to moderate incomes. Currently we have um, just over 900 members, uh, approaching 1,000. We did lose about 14% of our membership last year during COVID um, with you know, restrictions on travel and um, area college students leaving the community and not coming back. Um, but we've been able to maintain a pretty strong membership despite the challenges of COVID. Um, and as I mentioned, we're among the, the smallest car sharing operators in the country, and we remain one of, the, um, one of a handful of nonprofits. So a uh, kind of basics of how it works uh, for those who, who are curious about the technology. So as I mentioned, the, the vehicles are all decentralized. They're located in private and, and public spaces throughout um, the city. Um, we partner closely with uh, the city of Burlington and other cities, other municipalities where we've located vehicles to have uh, both on-street parking and parking in public spaces. We also collaborate with housing developers and property managers to park on site at locations there. Vehicles are available 24 seven. You can reserve a vehicle online um, or with a smartphone and, um, or for folks who don't have access to te technology, they can call our office and we'll help them out with that. Um, you go to the vehicle when you have a reservation and you hold either a key fob or your um, smartphone uh, up to the vehicle and it will unlock for you if you have a reservation, um, you get in and drive. 
and as I mentioned, you pay according to how much you drive. CarShare's model is to try is to charge both by the hour and by the mile, so that our rates are really reflective of how not just the time you have the vehicle, but how far you drive. Rates are all inclusive of um, gas or electricity if you're using an electric vehicle. Um, maintenance repairs. We clean the vehicles every every couple of weeks. Uh, in the wintertime, we have volunteers that we call pod nannies that remove snow. So it's really a, a seamless, self-accessible service. So today we have 17 have question. Oh, there it is. I was just going to think, how many vehicles do you have? There you go. I'll be quiet. <laughs> It's there. Great. <laughs> so we currently have 17 in service with um, three more that we're uh, about to roll out. And um, we offer different types of vehicles to meet different types of trip purposes. So we have, uh, you know, mostly a number of um, fuel efficient, small compact cars. We have some hatchbacks. We are adding more um, electric vehicles, which is exciting. So we currently have in our fleet one fully electric vehicle and three plug-in hybrid vehicles. Um, with three more 100% EVs about to roll out hopefully later this month um, as part of a, a green lining initiative that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, let, me, and let me ask you a question on that, ma'am, before we go, because now it's starting, some of it is starting to come back, some of the conversation in um, the Senate T-bill, they made available uh, the for the incentive program for a nonprofit that I'm going to assume that this would be something that you could you could take advantage of uh, in purchasing more uh, uh, plug in hybrids or all electrics Would that. That, be that is exactly right. So um, our our program serves a number of people, the majority of our members own zero or one vehicle per household. So nearly half of our members are you don't own a car, whether by choice or necessity, and they're able to access vehicles through our program. And we would like to expose them and make, make electric vehicles more readily available. But for us as a, as a small independent nonprofit, there, it, it makes a difference to, to purchase a full price EV. And there, as you probably know, there are not a lot of um, used electric vehicles on the market. And so this would allow us to more affordably integrate EVs and plug-in EVs into our, our fleet um, for the purpose of being sharing. And it it would maximize our environmental impact. So our members already reduced their VMT significantly and reduced their emissions significantly, and they could do so even more with, uh, with cleaner vehicles. Thank you. I see another member's hands up. Representative McCoy. Yes, Thank you. Uh, I apologize. I, I had a phone call, so I missed the previous slide on this. Did you say that you uh, Burlington had a couple of different areas where pickup is possible? Correct. Okay. We, so we, we have 17 different locations. Oh, 17 different locations. Okay, so when the member returns it to the location where they got it from, um, is the car cleaned at all? I mean, I'm just thinking of our COVID world now. Sure. Um, so at the start of COVID, we were sanitizing vehicles between trips. Um, and that, that, proved, that was necessary, but it proved to be um, not practical for a very small staff. So instead, we've, we're using ozone generators that we've installed in the vehicles. And so between every trip, there is a 90 minute buffer and that generator runs and aerates the vehicle, disinfects, and then it is ready to go for the next user. So there's a built-in buffer. Members do not have to plan for that. Our system will automatically kind of block out the car between trips. And then of course, we, we do wash the, we, the vehicles get a nice deep cleaning every two weeks um, or as needed if, if it comes up in between. Um, and during COVID, we're encouraging members if um, to bring their own you know, hand sanitizer, wash their hands regularly and wear masks when they use our vehicles. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Representative Smith, you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you for this information, Annie. I, I have got a couple of questions. I, I don't really see Car Share Vermont being very beneficial to like Brownington or, or Coventry or Derby. Uh, I got a feeling this is all going to be centralized in, in the cities like Burlington, Montpelier, Rutland. Am I correct on that? That's a good question. So so the way that um, the, that current operators exist, it has largely been based in urban areas where there's um, a, a range of, of modes that make it easier to be 
um, less car dependent. So where there's robust transit and other services, there's good, you know, biking. So, um, so, someone would need transportation to get to a car share car. Uh, and we don't, we don't have taxis or, or transit or anything around here in Derby and Newport area. Sure. And, and I think that that's the, the greater distances between where people live and work is a challenge in, in Vermont's more rural, rural towns. Um, I think that there's still a possibility for shared vehicles in areas where there's a town center, if it were possible for people you know, to access that car, or it could be a different model, re kind of rethinking what car sharing looks like in those smaller towns. And um, one way that exists is that people um, are able to share vehicles that they already own. So a neighbor has a pickup truck. They could share it with their neighbor um, for a fee. There are some, some insurance implications with that model, which is called peer-to-peer -peer mm -hmm. car sharing, but that may be an appropriate way for a group of neighbors to be able to have access to a shared vehicle. Um, similarly, if a, if a town had a municipal vehicle that wasn't used nights and weekends, they could make that available to community members. There would be some insurance uh, logistics to work out, but that could be one way. Mm -hmm. to serve the smaller towns. Okay. Uh, you got 17 vehicles and 900 members. How the heck do they share? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so it's a people, great question. <laughs> people. So our vehicles are used an average of, of over six hours a day. Did this last month, they were used upwards of seven hours a day, but that's unique users. So it's not the same person blocking it out for the day. Car sharing is typically not used for commuting because it doesn't make sense to pay to, to you know, drive five miles to get to work and then have it sit in a parking lot for eight hours, right. if assuming you were commuting and not working remotely. Um, so people really do use it for short active trips, like going grocery shopping, getting to medical appointments, uh, visiting family. You can take our cars out of state. You can take them to Canada. So people, non-COVID times, more you know, uh, recreational travel. Um, but the typical reservation is is sh is short, and it's a and a only you know twenty mile trip. So you have multiple users sharing the same vehicle throughout the day, and also as I mentioned, car sharing. Um, results in a reduction in how how much people drive. And so they're able to just plan their trips around the availability of our vehicles and they tend to drive a lot less. The average car share member spends only about $100 a month on our service. All right. And that's a pretty active user. All right, thank you for your information. Sure. I see Representative McCoy. Yes, um, <clears throat> this is the grandmother and me coming out. Uh, do you have car seats or does the member have to supply them? Sure, we, we do serve a lot of a lot of families with young children, um, m most of our staff included, and and that's an, a, a real important issue that we've we've tried to address. But we do not provide car seats um, because car seats come in so many different sizes and specifications depending on the vehicle, and so it wouldn't be safe for us to leave you know an infant seat in the car if somebody had a toddler. So um, people do need to provide provide their own. Okay, and then. Um... One more question when you were talking about the possibility of municipal vehicles, if they're not used on the weekend, the possibility of car sharing or renting them out, uh, maybe uh, insurance issues with that. Do you know of any other uh, state that actually does that, that municipalities do that? I don't know where it is um, where it is actively happening. It is something. It is a model that we have um, started to explore with with Burlington. They're not quite ready to to do that this year with uh, with other kind of priorities and, um, and and things going on. But you know, for example, DPW has um, trucks that may not be used on weekends. Some of them definitely are, but some trucks may not be used, and that could be a way that uh, we could expand. Um, the availability of trucks in our fleet. We currently have one. Um, so it isn't impossible. It would just be working out some risk and in insurance. We do fully insure our vehicles at a at a at a level of a million dollars. We provide excellent insurance. So our our members would be covered. Um, so I think it is a way that it, a fairly controlled risk. It's just a matter of exploring and trying that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Should I move on or are there? 
I think I see one more hand. Great. We start with something. Representative White. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I've I've read ahead. See, this is when you put the slides online. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we get to <laughs> um, and I would just ask that in the next slides, if you have the opportunity to cover um, how you see um, expansion for car share throughout the state. I know Representative Smith asked about kind of the rural angle of things, and I'll just put a seed out there. You know, I'm in White River Junction, Hartford, Hanover with Dartmouth, very similar makeup of a community uh, to Burlington, it feels like. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to that, but um, it looks like you have some of that um, with the grant that you mentioned. Um, sure. I, well, I'd be happy to, so so I don't lose track of the question, I'd be happy to address that now before, before going on to, into our current grant. Um, so uh, as a we, we, our business model is to be a nonprofit, and, and that is primarily because we will always want it to be guided by our mission, um, and also because um, car sharing is not a, a prof profitable service to provide. It is, it is expensive, and it is, um, it is similar. It's kind of like micro public transit, and so we have been, um, our, our ability to expand has largely been restrained by our funding and our ability to cover the capital cost of that expansion. So in a, in a typical year, and not, not counting COVID where our revenues did decline a bit um, early on, uh, we typically cover anywhere from, you know, 70 to 80% of our operating costs from earned income from our service. Um, and so to expand to areas that may not generate that level of usage, we would need to identify a sustained source of funding to help subsidize the vehicles. Um, we also are a very small staff. We've got 4.25 equivalents, um, and we're able to efficiently manage our fleet within the Burlington area. We've had vehicles and Winooski, um, we would just need to have a model where if we had vehicles throughout the state and potentially, you know, two and a half hours from our Burlington base, that there was a kind of foundational system to be able to provide those communities with the support they need. Our system is largely self-accessible. It can kind of run independent of people, but when a person is, is needed, like there's a parking van and a vehicle gets towed, you do need boots on the ground to troubleshoot the situations. Um, and also it's really important, we found in the Burlington area to facilitate the uh, adoption of car sharing, having local community members who are really anchors and, and advocating for car sharing to get their neighbors and friends and family to participate. So I think that there are a, you know, a couple of ways that car sharing could expand to other parts of Vermont and that is with available funding to help underwrite the, um, the operating costs for those for the for the vehicles that will need more subsidy um, and 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 other kind of wraparound resources and also um, partnering with uh, encouraging housing developers to integrate car sharing into development so as they're building housing they're thinking about the transportation needs of their residents and you know kind of shifting away from the mindset that everybody who who moves there will need to or be able to afford to own a vehicle, perhaps having car sharing on site could facilitate some of the transportation needs there. Thank you. And uh, I, I'm excited to hear more about how the micro transit grant in particular might be able to help facilitate some of the affordable housing work that you're doing too, because that we have a lot of affordable housing development coming up in White River Junction um, because we have a extreme housing crisis. Um, in our part, as I'm sure every representative on this <laughs> meeting is probably experiencing too, but um, it'll be interesting to see if you have suggestions on how we can continue to facilitate that um, legislatively. Excellent. So thank you. I see one more hand, I think. Yes, you do. Representative Savage, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, uh, back to just for a moment, the um, the idea of municipal vehicles being used, um, which is on the surface not a bad idea, but I think um, uh, in my time in municipal government, involved in municipal government, I was always informed that it's against state law 
for municipal equipment to be used for personal purposes. Um, so I think if, if that is the case, which I, I've heard it from several different sources, we'd probably next year have to do something legislatively to allow that to occur. Just a thought. Yeah, that's good information. And it, and it may be that, um, that an easier way to facilitate uh, car sharing in, in smaller, uh, more rural towns may be through shared vehicles that are owned by individuals that are privately owned. And there are already um, systems available to facilitate that. There's a web-based app called Truro, where if, if you own a car that, or a, an extra vehicle that you do not use regularly, you can put it into that system and others would be able to see it and, um, and reserve it and pay for it. Yeah. And you'd earn a little income from it. Um, Lots of food for thought. We're all thinking about like, oh, wait a minute. I didn't think of that. <laughs> yeah. I used to think about it. I know we'll get off track, but watching in my yard, like the five back lawns and everybody's doing a track. I thought, why couldn't we just get one or two tractors? Do we need five? But it goes to that same premise. Yeah. I mean, I, there's a possibility if you, if we find a insurance underwriter who would cover yeah. tractors and we, we think about, you know, being on the lake boats and Last year, we were thinking, gosh, could we get an RV with COVID, you know, to help people? But it'd be interesting that, you know, we don't all need access to these. We all need access. We don't all need to own our, our own vehicle. Um, so just to give a, a sense of our impact, what these 900 plus members, um, what, what, their, what their decision to car share results in for our community. So um, in 2020, 44% of our members reported being car free with 86% um, belonging to one or zero vehicle households. So we survey our members annually and this um, stat is consistent year over year. Um, so people, you know, I think a lot of people come into car sharing, not owning a vehicle. They may start out as a, as a zero, house, zero car household and we're giving them access, but um, many others start out as two vehicle households and they're downsizing to one or one vehicle households and they're downsizing to zero. So for every vehicle we put into service, 15 are removed from the road at the rate at which our members shed vehicles. 75% um, of our members last year reported shedding or opting not to purchase a vehicle um, when they joined CarShare Vermont. And because CarShare Vermont facilitates a reduction in driving, our members um, reduce their VMT by over 1 million miles per year, which results in a reduction of over 500 tons of CO2 emissions. And as I mentioned, through our mobility share program, we're able to offer uh, free memberships to individuals and households with low to moderate incomes. This is a program that we've funded through um, various means. We started it with a, with a generous grant from a foundation. When those funds expired, um, we had to shift the program so that we were able to con continue to subsidize those memberships. Um, and but we made a commitment to fundraise. We do a, an annual dinner every year that raises money to be able to continue to support those memberships. Um, with our green lining project, which I'm about to talk about, we're making a commitment to really grow membership in mobility share to serving um, 250 households in this coming year. So we recently um, were very fortunate to receive a 100,000 MTI grant from VTrans, a mobility and transportation innovation grant. And this was the highest amount, uh, the, the highest level of funding um, made available to organizations that had a project ready to implement on the ground. And we were, th we were thrilled to be able to do that. Um, so this is allowing us to locate four to six electric vehicles on site at affordable and public housing. We're partnering with Cathedral Square, Champlain Housing Trust, um, BHA, and hopefully others. Um, and it will pay for the infrastructure. So the charger and the infrastructure to get the charger installed. And then we'll be providing free memberships to all residents of the, of the developments. Um, and a free annual membership, an annual membership typically costs in CarShare Vermont $150 for the year. So that would be waived and the application fee would be reduced. And then we're planning to subsidize um, driving rates for those EVs during weekdays. Um, and uh, that would hopefully deepen the affordability of the program for users. 
Um, and this is an exciting opportunity. You know, we've long been committed to using car share as a way to increase mobility and, and address inequities in our transportation system. And even just having an alternative to vehicle ownership helps us accomplish that. But this allows us to do much more by bringing vehicles on site to locations that uh, will likely require a bit more subsidy. So we're really excited about, about this project. Um, since securing the $100,000 from VTrans, we've continued to fundraise. Um, and so we've secured an additional $85,000, which will allow us to, to hit that, that six vehicle mark um, if all goes well. So uh, we're excited and, and I think this is a model that we'd love to continue to expand in our community. So I got a, I've got a question on that. So I'm I'm envisioning myself living at Cathedral Square or someplace. And you know, as I start to get closer to 80, I may not be driving as much and it may not be, I might be a person who has a membership for the car share, or in this case, it have, have it available. Would I be able to say, oh, my niece is in town and she's visiting for the weekend and I have a membership? Is she would she be able to drive with me? With a, with a little bit of advanced planning, she could join your membership and get in. We'd, we would just have to verify her driving record and she could use the service under your membership. So we allow multiple, um, with, yeah. with permission of the primary account holder, you can have others join your membership. Okay, thank you. Um, Representative Burke and then Representative Shaw. Yeah, I don't know if you have more slides, if I should wait till the end or. I have a couple more, but. I'm happy to answer your question. Okay. Well, I have a lot of them. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Molly, well, or Representative Burke, do you want to, you can, why don't we finish? I'll just wait let till me, the end. Yeah, we'll let Representative Shaw go, and then Molly has a, a multitude of really good questions. Go ahead, Representative Shaw. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair, and, and Annie, I developed some questions uh, on the program, I'm very much interested in Car Share Vermont, uh, but I have a couple of questions for you and then maybe a comment. But what is your corporate structure? I hear you talking about San Francisco coming to Vermont. Uh, I understand you're a nonprofit, but uh, uh, what is your financial backing beyond the state of Vermont? Sure. We're, so we're a 501c3 Vermont based nonprofit. Um, and we are we are governed by a board of directors, um, and we are primarily funded through earned income generated from the service we provide. And then we uh, receive support from Vermont Agency of Transportation um, year after year from the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission through the Unified Planning Work Program, UPWP grant funds, and through individual donors, business donors and um, foundation support. Um, we, early on in our existence, the, the, the makeup was that we were, you know, maybe covered 40 to 50% of our operating costs from our revenue. So we were more um, supported by private foundations in our early days. But as we've been able to slowly build our service and build our membership and increase usage of our service, we've become largely um, self-sufficient. So you're not governed by, you're governed by, a, a, I'm assuming, a local board of directors, Correct. Not, uh, uh, not from a national national board or national uh, uh, company, uh, car share California or car share New York or somebody like that. Correct. City, city car share was also an independent um, nonprofit car sharing operator, which really just served as a, as a model and a mentor um, for the um, the growth of nonprofit operators in other states, so from that experience, I bring just that my my experience and my um, my interest in car sharing. But I'm actually a native Vermonter, and when when I moved back here, um, it was really rethinking what worked in the Bay Area is very very different from how how our program operates. Um, and in fact, many of the nonprofits in other um, in other cities. Uh, no longer exist because they've actually been a, a acquired or outcompeted by the for profits that have entered the market. So, so we're kind of unique in holding our own. Great, I appreciate your enthusiasm, uh, and thanks for coming back to Vermont. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think uh, Representative White spoke to this, uh, and and I think she's thinking of over in the uh, 
uh, Connecticut River Valley, uh, the need. Uh, I'm thinking of the need in Rutland and maybe, maybe Representative Cochran wants to talk about the need in Bennington County for this type of program, understanding that our populations are much less than the populations of Chittenden County and specifically Burlington. Unfortunately, uh, this, is, this, is nothing, uh, this is nothing to do with you, Andy, but unfortunately, in my view, card share Vermont only in Chittenden County uh, uh, points out uh, the, the divide between urban and rural Vermont. Uh, and that's just the divide that we from more rural parts of Vermont see. So we're longing for these types of services, but because it's difficult to put those types of services into areas where you don't have the population. I think you spoke that to, that to uh, Representative White. Uh, beyond what I, uh, the, the uh, grant, granting money that's in the transportation bill, uh, there's also a piece in the transportation bill that speaks to transportation equity and a report on transportation equity. And this, this type of program that you're promoting here fits into that because transportation equality is not equal throughout the state. Uh, so this is important, and I, I would hope that maybe we could have you back next year to talk about your thoughts on how to expand this into lower populate, play, populated areas. And, how, you know, obviously you'll be back looking for money, but how it could work. And I'm thinking Middlebury with Middlebury College, 2,600 students, they all don't drive a car. Uh, I'm thinking Bennington area, Bennington College, uh, some of the larger factories and some of the housing projects down there. We have housing projects all over Vermont that, that rival uh, CHT, Cathedral Square, uh, and, and, and other areas. So uh, the, the need is there. It's just, how do we get there? And I'm not going to ask you to answer that today, but maybe when we have you back uh, next session, we can talk about that. Thank you. Abs absolutely. Uh, all excellent points. And, um, and, I think that there are different ways of envisioning a model that addresses the inequity of rural areas, and it and it and it may serve a different purpose than trying to reduce VMT. You know, we're we're likely going to need to increase VMT for a number of people who currently lack access to a vehicle, um, which I think is still very important. You know, increasing mobility, and I and um, so I think that there are ways to to get at that and develop a, a program that would be. Uh, more conducive for smaller rural towns. And we'd love to keep continue to work on that. Great, thank you for thinking about that for us. Sure. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Representative Shaw. I, I, you know, I agree, like when we see something, we something that's just growing, it's been, you know, and it's taking off and we all start to get excited about what it could mean statewide as well. I know that it takes people and it takes, it takes people and it takes some, some startup money and, and then people to keep it going. And I would agree, I think Rutland area is, as much as I would love to see it in my area, I do believe Rutland has the, the population base if, if they so choose to wanna have this available to them to maybe make it a financially viable uh, area as well as. So, so anyway, well, let's let you finish up and you got. So I, I, I think I touched on this earlier with the question about um, the making a nonprofit mobility providers like CarShare Vermont eligible for the incentives. Um, and, and the rationale is that we would like to more um, readily integrate EVs into our fleet and uh, lowering the cost would make us be able to do that more affordably. And of course, uh, pass on those savings to our members. So we typically, um, you know, in a, in a, typical year without extra funding to help us, to give us the capital to acquire EVs, we're typically looking at vehicles like a Honda Fit or that make and model that is about an $18,000 vehicle. And, um, and then in contrast, an EV without any sort of rebate or incentive could be upwards near $30,000. And so we're just looking to, to be able to more affordably make these vehicles available to more people. Um, also research shows that car sharing is a really effective means of exposing the public to EVs because they can try them out. And then if they ever get to a point in their life where they're needing, there's a life change that facilitates 
a need to own a vehicle, they're, they're more likely to, um, to purchase an EV. So that is in line with just advancements in, in EV adoptions that's happening statewide and, and nationally. Um, and, and so that's kind of the, that is the, the rationale for wanting to be included there. Um, and, and that's all I have for my presentation. Um, I also did want to mention in, in response to the comments about, uh, you know, how we had get this statewide is that Vermont is, um, is unique in that we're one of the few states in, in New England that has car sharing in, in, in actually the, the country that has car sharing in a city as small as Burlington, but there are other states and other organizations thinking about this. And there could be some collaboration. I know that Maine is interested. There are um, communities in Massachusetts that are interested. And so I do think that there are some creative ways to design uh, a program efficiently in collaboration with some of these other partners um, that, could, that could help create the systems to uh, facilitate these this more rural model. So it's it it may seem far off and like a like a pipe dream to have um, car share in a small town or in even places like Rutland and, and Bennington, but um, I do think that it it is in the future. Yeah, I could easily see myself going. Oh, I'm down in Boston. I just my ability, my membership allows me to access a car around Boston or on the coast of Maine or all these all a variety of different things. Obviously, I'm thinking about going somewhere, maybe <laughs> like all of us. <laughs> so Representative Berg has has the uh, has the floor now to be, she's got quite a few questions. Thanks. Well, and comments. Uh, Annie, I am so impressed with what you've done. I mean, Thank this you. is amazing. You just, you took an idea out of your experience and started this amazing thing. And, you know, we talk about how can we cut carbon emissions, et cetera, et cetera. And you've just sort of been doing this under the radar. So I'm just, this is wonderful. And it's also great that you've been able to um, stay a nonprofit. And I hope that can continue because I know it can be tempting to get bought out, but um, it seems like, you know, you have that, that mission. Uh, so, I, and I remember hearing about you, Whedon, my first year on the committee, we went to the Burlington Airport and you and John Castle, I think, came in and talked about this. So that must have been very early on in your in your uh, life of your organization. And um, and then I think you came back a couple of years ago, maybe to the committee. Yeah. Anyway, it was at the end of the session again. And um, yeah, but I, I think I, I would love to like engage with you earlier in the session and, you know, discuss some of these issues. Uh, a couple of questions I have is, and I'm thinking about Brattleboro, and I think I met, you know, and again, it's sort of one of these towns where maybe is there enough density, except we have a lot of sort of low income housing that's close to downtown and, and even more is coming and and also in some other developments out um, a little bit out, you know, a couple of miles out of town. So I could see like being able to work with some of these providers of housing and like, like you mentioned, and um, I'm excited about that. I wanna put our sustainability coordinator in touch with you to just start conversations. Um, sure. His name is Steven Dotson. So if you don't mind, I'll do a little email introduction. And, um, but one of the questions I have is, okay, if you have cars parked on the street, like in Brattleboro, we have a, a parking ban during the winter. And I know Montpelier has a parking ban only when, when the, um, you know, on certain days when they, when they send out an email saying, you got to get your car off the road. And that I was a victim of not doing that one morning and had to go get my car at seven o'clock in the morning, way out on Elm Street. Anyway, uh, so I'm just wondering how you deal with that. And also then my other questions are, how do you, like who fills up the gas tank and, and, and who charges the car? And is that all done by volunteers or how does that all work? Sure, good questions. So the parking, it's, I mean, that is the reality of being in a, in a rural state and in a winter state where there are parking bans and it can be, it can be a real hassle. In Burlington, we um, every year have to find off-street alternative parking for our vehicles. Fortunately, parking bans are announced in advance, so we have some warning, and we do have 
um, either with, among our staff and some volunteers that will relocate vehicles when there's a ban and move them back um, when it ends. And our members know if the parking ban lights are on and you have the vehicle, you know, you're returning it after midnight, you need to return it to the parking ban location. It becomes trickier when you, um, when you are operating remotely, you know, you're serving a different community. So we were in Montpelier for two years and um, it wasn't always clear when there was a parking ban and sometimes it wouldn't be snow related. It could be because a water line broke and we wouldn't know and our vehicle would get towed and it could create a real headache for the users there. And so I think that speaks to the need to have it, it, there really needs to be a kind of a local presence and some, some um, you know, volunteers, but also some paid positions to, to be able to service or through partnership, you know, if it is a housing developer, so, you know, that wouldn't be an issue because the vehicle would be off street, but, but having some sort of a local anchor to deal with some of those logistical challenges. Um, it might be good if we take down the, the uh, shared screen so we can see everybody else. Yes, good point. Thanks. Did I just do that? Um, there we go. Uh, I still have the screen up. I think maybe if you go and exit, I don't know. There we go. There we go. Ready? Okay, great. Um, so. Uh, so we were able to, to deal with those challenges in Montpelier, but it, it can create a ripple effect and then our service becomes less reliable. You know, if the, if the person showed up for the vehicle that was towed, that can create a really unfavorable experience for, for the community, um, but it's not impossible to solve. And then the issue of, of gas or, or recharging the vehicle, that's on the member. So we, we do place a, a fuel card or in every vehicle or a charge card if it's at a charging station. And it's the member's responsibility to either leave it with a quarter tank of gas, minimum quarter tank, so stop for fuel, um, and it, we pay for it, or to plug in the vehicle at the end of the trip. And during a trip in an EV, they really need to plan carefully. So if they're planning to take the vehicle um, you know, out of state or beyond the vehicle's range that they'll need to allow for that time and pay for that time to charge during during their trip. Mm -hmm. And can you take a vehicle like overnight, say somebody wanted to go skiing somewhere, they could take the vehicle up to, you know, to Mad River Glen or someplace and stay the weekend and come back? Absolutely. You can go anywhere in the U.S. and Canada. Uh-huh. Great. That was what I was thinking. Can I go to Canada? Yeah. All right. Um, I think that's all my questions, but uh, definitely exciting. And sounds like somebody from your organization has been down to the, the yard where they tow the cars in Montpelier too. <laughs> How many other people on this call have had that happen? <laughs> Becca? <laughs> anyway, okay, thank you so much for, for your work. It's really You're exciting. You're welcome, thank you. We're really glad we could have you come in. We've seen your name on, on different things and, and we hear about it, but I, I personally haven't had you in. I see that we've got a few other hands up. We've got Representative uh, Stebbins, then Representative Bartholomew, and then Representative Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had to say, this is my constituent and isn't she awesome? <laughs> <laughs> so that was all I wanted to say. Um, Annie, it's great to have you here. And it's also just great to have someone who um, what uh, Representative Burke was saying, you know, had an idea, picked it up, moved it forward. And I know it's been, um, you know, it's not like uh, for, for the committee members, you know, it's it's steady as the course. Um, and, and to the extent that we could figure out how to support this into other places, into Rutland, into Brattleboro, I, um, it's, it's a, it would be really fantastic if we could add that to our policy toolbox um, in terms of you know the various options that people have um, to to see more equity in transportation. So thanks so much for coming, Annie. I just wanted to toot my constituents' horn. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> that's always that's always a unique feeling. I have to tell you that I used to feel so bad for Representative Hooper. Everyone in the witness chair was always a constituent. <laughs> <laughs> she was in my failure. So um, I think it's my first. It's so exciting. <laughs> so, Representative Bartholomew and then Representative Smith. 
I had a couple questions about your um, your costs. And one that pops to mind is insurance. Um, is it really difficult to find a, a company that will cover these vehicles at an affordable um, rate? And I'm thinking particularly what happened to my insurance rate when I added a driver who was under 25. Um, it seems like that would be extraordinarily expensive with the, uh, to underwrite a vehicle when you don't know who's going to be driving it. Sure. Or it, how it, far. It is complex and um, knock on wood, we are fortunate in Vermont. We're, we're insured by um, the Alliance of Nonprofit Insurance or um, ANI, uh, which only insures nonprofits and only in certain states where they underwrite plans, um, policies. And Vermont is one of them. They actually originated in Vermont and California. So they also were the insurance underwriter for um, city car share way back when. Um, they are no longer really engaging too much in the car sharing industry because it is a high risk industry. And there are other underwriters, but um, typically they are looking at the premiums are so significant based on volume. So it'd be really challenging for, uh, or very expensive for a small operator to acquire insurance. Um, and some states that are no fault states like New York, it is in excruciatingly expensive to acquire insurance. And, and that issue alone is what put Buffalo Car Share, one of our peers that started um, a, a year after Car Share Vermont, it put them out of business. And it was really unfortunate because um, Buffalo is a, is a much different community than, than Burlington. There are some similarities, but 85% of Buffalo Car Share members were low to very low income. And then they just completely lost their, their mobility option when Buffalo Car Share um, mm -hmm their underwriter dropped them from their insurance. So it's a tricky issue. Our insurance comp compared to our peers is, you know, is relatively affordable. It still is a significant cost of, you know, operating cost for us to overall, um, but we're um, lucky compared to some of our friends in other states. So because um, insurance rates are usually based for, for auto, are usually based on, on driving record age um, and how far you drive. Um, well, so when you mentioned um, doing a car share, um, say a, a, a group of people wanted to get together and, and, and do it, so if I'd like, if I wanted to car share my car, would I be able to get insurance to do that? Because I'm not a nonprofit. It would be, um, you would need to do it through uh, an existing system. Um, I, I, to, to be clear, you know, some people I think are already doing that informally, whether or not they're assuming some um, risk is in question. You know, uh, many insurance um, underwriters have a provision that if you uh, make your vehicle available for hire, so in exchange for payment, um, they will not provide coverage for that incident if there if there were an event, a collision, or or damages. Um, so I think that people may be doing that informally with or without um, understanding what their policy will cover. Platforms like Turo that I mentioned, where you can put your vehicle online, there is a, a, a basic modest level of insurance that is, that is covered for you as the vehicle owner and for the person borrowing your car. Um, but it is not black and white and it gets tricky and, and an insurance um, provider could still deny coverage. So there are some legislative changes that could try to safeguard that mode more and other states have made provisions to facilitate the expansion of peer-to-peer of -peer car sharing. Um, in, in, in our instance at CarShare Vermont, we've been, our model has, has worked because we are in you know, the densest part of the state where it is quite possible for people to live car free. So there was less need to facilitate sharing among, among personally owned vehicles. But I see that as being um, an effective way to, to make car sharing available in outside of Chittenden County. So, so you're quite fortunate, but um, really the insurance question is, is an impediment to, to um, the way the industry is set up. What I'm hearing it, say it is, and, and you know, our underwriter has been um, loyal and, and and steady, and we've been fortunate to 
manage our claims. And um, we have had some losses. We lost, we had a string of, of, of crashes a couple of years ago, no injuries, but we've lost a number of our vehicles um, and they keep insuring us, but they won't insure things like our vehicles cannot be used for ride hailing. So somebody could not join CarShare Vermont and then work as an Uber or Lyft driver to gain employment. That wouldn't be covered. Um, and so those are issues that we, you know, you could have a more complex, Complex integrated system. If our vehicles could be used for those multiple purposes, um, so, you know, our our underwriter prohibits even using our vehicles for, you know, like a volunteer driver program as well. And that's not something that is, you know, impossible to to try to sh to shift. But at the moment, we have some restrictions. And my other question relates to your upfront costs. And maybe you said, and I missed it, but. It seems like your model is is kind of backwards versus um, uh, and I'm I don't mean that in a negative way, but in terms of you have this huge upfront cost of buying a vehicle, and your income then is is um, a relatively low monthly fee or uh, you know use fee to recover the money. That so how how do you come up with that upfront cost to buy them? Is that all through grants? It's shifted over the years. So in early on in our inception, um, I forgot to mention that we, we do partner closely with our local campuses, UVM and Champlain College. And early on in our existence, the those institutions actually purchased some of the vehicles that were part of our fleet. So that if, you know, they were taking a, a risk wanting to support a local startup nonprofit. And if things did not go as planned, you know, they would still have the asset of, of owning those vehicles. We've since acquired those vehicles and, and replaced them and, and many others. And so in some instances, um, depending on our, our finances and our cash flow, we'll lease vehicles and we do work with a commercial um, leasing agency um, or, or we will finance vehicles with our local bank. Um, and sometimes we'll have, we do have enough capital. We also are in the market of selling our vehicles. So uh, every, you know, depending on, on how the vehicle's condition, we can keep a vehicle uh, up to at most maybe six years, but we're usually selling it four or five years. And so we have the, 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 the sale of the asset that goes towards the purchase of another vehicle. So sometimes we're able to just use our cash. It really depends um, kind of where we are in the year and, and what our cash flow situation. And it, it's really difficult to procure grants for those capital expenses. So we're fortunate with this current round of funding from V trans that it um, can be used towards capital expenses like like purchasing these EVs. Well, that could be a real impediment if someone wants to start up a new uh, ride share in another because because that big upfront cost. Correct. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative Bartholomew. I have Representative Smith, and then Representative Burke. Is that a new hand or an old hand? New new hand. Okay. Representative Smith, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I just had someone from Fish and Game call me on another question, but they'll call me back. Uh, you, you, could you give me an idea of your rate breakdown? Like if someone wants to rent a vehicle to go from Burlington to Rutland or something like that for say three hours or four hours, could you give me an idea what it might cost? Sure, so we charge by the hour and by the mile. Um, and, it, and it does vary depending on what rate plan you're on. We offer different membership plans that people can choose based on how much they think they're going to drive. Um, so for example, if you are in our 100% electric vehicle, that's a, a flat fee as well because we're not paying for, for fuel. We just include however many miles you, you, know, you can drive there actually is a is a is a day cap on the mileage, but um, but anyway, that's a flat ten dollars an hour. So you can predict how much time you're going to need for the trip, and then you can calculate that way. For our um, other vehicles, the minimum driving rate is six fifty per hour and thirty eight cents per mile, and with again gas and insurance included. And then you can um, we have a calculator on our uh, reservation page and our website, so that if you can kind of get an estimate of your destination and do the round trip, you know, the distance, you can get a good idea of what it, what, what it'll cost. But it really does depend on those two inputs, how long you're going to have the vehicle uh, and where you're traveling to and from. All right, thank you. Uh, one other question. If you've got a member that has been a member with you for a while 
And sometimes over a course of a year or so as being a member, that member acquires a driving record that is not, uh, does not go along with what your requirements are. How do you keep track of things like that? So um, we, at the start of, of membership, we do run a driving record to <clears throat> verify and members then commit to a member agreement where they are uh, responsible for reporting any violation that would make them ineligible. Um, we don't have a way to pull a driving record is uh, has a direct hard cost. It, it varies by state, but it's up to, I think it's 28 dollars now in Vermont. Um, so with 900 people, we don't run the records sure. every single year. Um, we could systematically come up with some randomized way, but that we may miss people. So really it's on the member's responsibility to, uh, to inform us. Otherwise they're in violation of our member handbook. And according to our member handbook, if they were, if they then were in an incident, or you know, had a crash with our vehicle and they shouldn't have been covered, we have the right to deny responsibility. Okay, thank you. We've never had that uh, come up, but. <laughs> yeah, hope you, hopefully you won't. Last question, uh, you must compete with Enterprise because their rates are similar to yours. We are, um, we, probably do compete with car rentals. We don't think of it as competition, however, because we think of it as, as our community members and users having a range of modes that they can access. So if they are planning a trip out of town and a rental from Enterprise or from our local rental company, we've got Majestic in Burlington, if that is the, the cheaper option when they factor in insurance and gas, we say, go for it because then it leaves our vehicles available to other members. So we see the modes as being really um, complementary, and, and whatever pieces people can fit together to help them own fewer cars. We think that's great. Good. Thank you very much. Sure. Are you all set representative Smith? I am. Thank you, Madam chair. You're, you're, you're welcome. Listen, committee, we're good. Um, Representative Burke, his hand is up, but I just want to let you know that um, at 1015, um, uh, myself and Anthea and Chris, our JFO and Ledge Council, we're going to go down to Ways and Means for a drive-by on uh, S47, because there was a question about how much, the, if there was an impact on the revenue. So we just want to make sure that we're, we've got that straightened out. And Representative Ansel made a funny she she said, oh, maybe we could just do a drive-by, ha-ha. And I went, oh, my God, it's catching on. So that's her one for the day. So I just want to let you know that I'm going to go to do that just to make sure things are things are okay, uh, um, which I know they will be. And I'll leave you in the, the best of hands of Representative Shaw. But after this witness, then we're good for the day unless something should pop up. And then we just follow Lori's direction, and she'll lead us. She will always lead us home. <laughs> right, Lori? Right. <laughs> All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head over, okay? Or I'll listen in for a minute, and then I'm going to head over. Representative Burke, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And we will miss you terribly, but I'm sure you can <laughs> do a very good drive-by in ways and means. Um, I'll try not to speed in any speed zones at all. <laughs> um, so, Annie, I just wanted to... You sort of referenced something about possible legislation. And it occurred to me that it might be helpful for us if you could sort of um, gather together some possibilities that might might help your organization with legislation. And I think you have a direct route to a, a uh, your legislator. <laughs> you could communicate that way and, and she could communicate it to us. So just a, a little bit, something you could, <laughs> we could be looking at over the summer. That's good. Great. Thank, thank you for that um, invitation. You know, we have a, a lot of ideas and we're also fortunate, um, you know, to have support from the legislature and also support from VTrans and some mm -hmm. great advocates there. But, um, you know, we've long had the idea of um, if there could be an entity 
similar to how there's an entity that governs public transit that can be thinking about these innovations in public transportation to include modes like car sharing. You know, it's um, it, it may not be possible to serve every town with a with a with a bus route and and in, invest in that infrastructure, but it could be possible to invest in various forms of car sharing that could meet a real mobility gap for residents and. Um, you know, we need to do more thinking as to how that would work, but there needs to be some sort of infrastructure and support and funding um, because it's not going to be efficient or remotely cost effective for a town that wants to, you know, maybe put one vehicle in, ser in service to build this web-based in in technologically intensive system um, to make that available to, to its residents. There are, are some efficiencies if there could be one kind of cohesive um, service that other towns could tap into if they you know, apply or meet some conditions. And you know, we would be thrilled to help, um, help work on that. Well, maybe um, building off of the micro transit uh, right. It's happening in Montpelier. Anyway, great. All right. Well, we should definitely continue this conversation. Thank you. So, any, thank you. I don't see any hands up. Uh, so, you apparently have worn the committee out. So, that's really <laughs> good. Uh, you answered a lot of questions and, and we appreciate it. You have us thinking, and I hope we have you thinking too on some of the comments that were made here. And uh, we'll surely be talking in the future. Uh, now that we know that we're, we're aware of your program and there seems to be interest in it and some expansion somehow. Vermont's a great partner. Maybe uh, maybe a little more conversation with, with AOT would be helpful. So Excellent. if anybody has anything else more for, uh, for our witness, Annie from uh, Card Chair Vermont. Seeing none, thank you, Annie, for coming in and, and we'll see you again, I'm sure. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank All you. All right, take care. All right, bye now. Bye-bye. So, uh, so for the committee, uh, I just heard Diane say that we're, this should just be done, but I believe, Lori, uh, you're gonna keep the uh, invitation open. Is, is that true? Yes. Okay, so if we need to come back or if you just feel like coming back and hanging out and talking to Lori or anybody that happens to be in here, come on back. Uh, I see Tim with a wry smile on his face. He's not coming back. So, uh, so thank you, Lori.